Uh, welcome everybody to my talk. Um, this is going to be creating high-performance web apps with WebAssembly. Um, before we start, I would like to ask, who has seen the Go and WebAssembly talk yesterday of you? I see, okay, there are a couple. Um, so Jesse, don't be disappointed. So uh, of course, there will, I will explain WebAssembly uh, too. But actually, I will go more into detail from the WebAssembly perspective. So not that much from um, the client side perspective, maybe. And uh, also, has somebody seen my other talk today before? Yeah, this one. Thanks. Ah, yeah, that's better. Uh, cool, yeah, uh, thank you for coming again. So I hope <laughs> I didn't disappoint you before and I try not to do it this time. So um, my name is Konstantin and um, I'm a performance engineer at Backend. And uh, I'm working there for uh, two years now and I did my Master of Science here in Hamburg and now uh, working professionally for a couple of years. So, and as a performance engineer, we are of course always looking for uh, some new ways in the web to um, deliver faster websites. And um, so now let's focus on WebAssembly. But before we start, okay, a bit of history. So where did we come from? So at first, okay, we had some kind of machine assembly code, right? Then uh, imperative code, so things started to getting better. We even then had object orientation. And uh, then, um, we had uh, fancier stuff like pattern matching and functional programming style. So, and um, now we're going back actually to assembly, right? So this is kind of odd. So we had the banana here and now we have the banana there too. So um, does this make sense? And uh, so what is this WebAssembly? Actually, um, this is the definition from the website themselves. So how WebAssembly explains what they are doing or what they are. Um, it's in binary instruction format, so the key difference to JavaScript is you don't have a text file, which is uh, the programming language being executed in the browser, but actually it's um, a binary instruction set. So um, what's special about this is that it's um, stack-based, so uh, I will explain on the next slide what that means. And uh, the key features here are it's uh, for portable targets, so uh, you can put it on your mobile device, you can put it on your desktop computer or on a server, and um, it's also deployable not only on the server side, but it's deployable on the client side. And I guess this is the most special part because um, until now, only JavaScript was the thing to do if you wanted to have a client side app in your browser and you just could have some. Uh, transpiling before it, like CoffeeScript, TypeScript, or anything like that, to transpile it to JavaScript and then being executed in the browser. But now you have the possibility to use a key different programming language to do this. So what is the stack-based machine? So uh, this is the imperative style, which you can write in JavaScript, for example. But if you have a stack-based machine, this looks like this. So um, you take the arguments for the operation, so for example, for the addition, and then um, this actually takes two values from the stack, which have been added before, and then you perform the operation, with, which puts actually the result of this operation um, onto the stack again, and then um, sets actually this way. So this is the equal sign operator from the left-hand side. And then it takes the result of this A also, and takes the E, puts them both onto the stack, then um, does a multiplication, and in the end, the value is again set to D. So these are equal, actually. And this is the kind of way how WebAssembly looks like from the inside. So um, the binary data or the programming style you have there looks actually like this. OK, so what are WebAssembly's benefits? So uh, of course, platform independence, this is a quite nice feature, because um, this is uh, this allows us to run WebAssembly nearly everywhere. Uh, we have near native speed. This is compared to JavaScript, uh, a really good benefit. I will show this by um, a demonstration with a benchmark in the end. 
um, we have interoperability. So WebAssembly um, has some security features, which I will introduce to you, but um, they still allow us to have some kind of um, imports in the WebAssembly sandbox. So you have the possibility to um, communicate with WebAssembly so um, you're not completely isolated on, this, uh, on the virtual machine that WebAssembly provides. And um, in the end, you also get small ex um, executables. So when you have to imagine like the function keyword in JavaScript has um, um, eight characters, so it's eight bytes. In WebSM, you would just encode this into one byte, and there you can see how you can uh, compress every kind of instruction that you have before um, in less bytes. So how is WebAssembly performing actually in the current browsers? And as you can see, every major browser engine supports WebAssembly. So you actually don't really need to polyfill it. Um, if you can drop support for Internet Explorer, like always, it's the one browser we don't like to use because it doesn't support the fancy new stuff. <laughs> but um, there are possibilities actually to execute WebAssembly code by having a JavaScript virtual, uh, virtual machine which executes WebAssembly code. Um, and also, uh, another thing which I want to um, pay your attention to is actually you can also run WebAssembly in Node.js. So since version 8, uh, Node.js can also execute WebAssembly code. So you're not limited to using it in a browser, but if you have um, compiled WebAssembly modules, you can also embed them on your server-side environment. Okay, so this was that about WebAssembly themselves. Now let's compare it with JavaScript. So uh, we have those two competing against each other. And if you look at JavaScript, it's quite slow um, to parse and execute. Well, WebAssembly is faster in this and also faster in execution time. With JavaScript, you have rather large file sizes. If you have large applications, for example, when you use Angular 2, you get a lot of library code with it. And um, you always have to ship this to the browser um, with like every page request. But um, when you have WebAssembly, on the other hand, you have smaller file sizes. Um, the library then is more compressed, so um, this is faster for the download and the user sees the page um, faster. So, um, and also JavaScript can be quite insecure because um, you have the global window object and you often have the problem there maybe that um, the user or that some kind of third-party library may interfere with your logic and bind something to the window object which you didn't mean to. Just take an example, you have some kind of library which corrupts the global dollar operator from jQuery which you relied on and then uh, maybe every kind of selector you use gets corrupted or gets, uh, uh, gets, uh, gets read while you do some operations with it. So a WebAssembly is the more secure because everything you want to use within WebAssembly you have to put into WebAssembly so it can use it and there's no possibility for any third party library to change your WebAssembly code or to change objects which you use in your WebAssembly code. Um, this also is um, quite something on the negative side for WebAssembly because in JavaScript we have a very open world. So you have the DOM API, you have the Streams API which I introduced in my last talk and um, you have many things you can just use directly within the JavaScript. And WebAssembly actually needs to uh, learn these features again. So um, they're just coming up, they're not there yet unfortunately. And uh, also, JavaScript can be written by hand, right? So if you want to prototype something, if you want to prototype a web application and um, just get things done uh, at first and fast, then um, you, you would rather use JavaScript at first just to, to test something or to try something, something out. Uh, while for WebAssembly, you will always need compiling first. And um, a very marvelous actually, which I want to show you too, um, JavaScript is quite easy to debug. You know, you can really have the debugger in your browser, then uh, set a breakpoint and wait for the application to wait there, and then you can debug through every step. WebAssembly can do this too, but you have to look at the stack-based code I showed you before. So um, this is quite hard because you don't see the original programming language. You wrote your application, 
in, um, and there's no support for um, source maps yet. If you know from JavaScript, so when you have another programming language compiled to JavaScript, then um, the browser can decode that into the original language. There's unfortunately no support for that yet in WebAssembly 2. So you have to, um, yeah, hope that you can recognize the structures or the functions um, that you wanted to use or that you use there, which are broken, to find the error. And this is quite hard. Um, but what we can see here, uh, every weakness from JavaScript has a bonus on the WebAssembly side. And uh, every bonus side on the JavaScript side is a weakness in WebAssembly. So why not have them both? <laughs> And um, this is why I want to say for, um, or the message I want to give you for this talk is uh, don't start rewriting your apps with WebAssembly. Just um, try to, p uh, to, to um, create new features or features which you want to have fast within WebAssembly and uh, make them additional to your existing JavaScript. So um, how can this look like maybe? So imagine you have um, a single page application with an React and, and Redux uh, front end, so uh, as your UI library. And then you have um, ES6 uh, controller modules which do your business logic. And then you have some kind of high performance parts which you want to be quite fast, pure functions, mathematical functions, something like that. Maybe you have um, a small mini game on your website and you want to have uh, maybe a jump and run game just to keep the attraction of your users. Then you can write those kind of parts in WebAssembly to make them faster and the user gets a better um, user experience. So, and um, on another key side, if you have maybe then uh, a server-side rendering part with Node.js here, um, then you maybe can also use the WebAssembly module which you use to render uh, an app or some kind of simulated image or something like that. You can also reuse the WebAssembly module on your Node.js side and render um, the same image or the same graphics too. So, uh, what use cases are enabled by that? So. Um, I guess everything which needs high performance or which needs many mathematical operations, uh, blockchain, AI, machine learning, 2D and 3D games, you name it. I guess every use case which you could imagine which uh, actually today was too slow for, Java, for JavaScript, sorry, um, either by because uh, the download size of the file was too large or um, because um, the uh, overhead from the garbage collector of JavaScript was too heavy you can do this with WebAssembly because you have the full control of how the browser executes your code. Because there's no garbage collector provided, so you have, would have to provide it on your own. But um, you have the full control of writing really high performance code. So, okay, now let's take a look at um, what features WebAssembly offers us compared to JavaScript. So if you know the JavaScript um, types, which we are getting used to, like number, boolean, string, function, object, um, for numbers, there are actually four data types in WebAssembly. So there's integer types with uh, 32 and 64 bits. Actually, less than 32 bits is not really supported. Um, so uh, if you have, um, like, only you, you want to um, analyze data on a byte side, actually, you have to uh, use um, an integer with 32 bits which is um, not that nice because you need to consume more memory, but um, it's the only way you can do it. But actually, there are operators, so um, if you want to um, use a 32-bit integer like an 8-bit integer, there are operators for that. So there is support for 8-bit values, but um, there is no support for a single 8-bit slot in the memory. Now let's look at booleans. Unfortunately, you even have to use there the 32-bit integers. So um, there's not some kind of I1 or this. And um, I don't think actually they're going to implement this. So maybe you have to actually put 32 Boolean flags into one integer if you want less mem memory consumption. Or otherwise, you will be stuck to use actually um, so the uh, one single I32 boolean. And now comes the very sad part, because for the other uh, three um, data types, actually WebAssembly has no support. So um, there's no native string 
there is no native function or um, closure construct or closure type which you can pass between JavaScript and between WebAssembly, and uh, also no higher data structures like um, yeah structs, classes, or anything like that. Okay, but uh, let's keep it there from the downside. Let's look at the upsides. So uh, let's take our mathematical abacus, which we know from JavaScript. And of course, all the arithmetical operations, which you know from JavaScript, are there in WebAssembly. So um, this is nice. And also, of course, all the comparison operators, which you know, are also there. And I guess, I don't know if you, if you did know all of them, actually I have to Google them up too. <laughs> the um, bitwise operations like shifting and like uh, and, or, and XOR, they're all included. But actually um, this one, the negation of bits, uh, the bitwise negation of integers is actually not there. But you can um, polyfill it by using the XOR operation with um, a minus one constant. So, and also um, these Boolean comparison operations, uh, which you know from JavaScript, are also not there because there's no Boolean type. So, um, you have to use the one from integer types and to apply them on uh, integers which just alternate between 0 and 1. But there are, um, therefore, on the other side, there are additional operations uh, which speed up the WebAssembly code because um, those. Uh, six operations here on the bottom, they are actually uh, implemented on your processor's architecture, but JavaScript has no native operators for them because actually we as developers uh, really don't use them. So uh, just to say what they are, uh, all right, let me go back there. So the one here, this is the equal zero operation. Actually, this just um, returns zero or one if the current stack, um, the current stack machine returns zero, then it will give a one. And if um, there's any other way, then we'll give zero. Then there's bit rotation for left rotation of bits and right rotation of bits. Then there's the so-called um, population count operator, which counts all the ones within your um, value. And there's then the count trailing zeros operator and the count leading zero operators, um, which you can need for some special operations within your code. I'm very sorry that the animation is broken for you guys. Uh, <laughs> it actually looks good to my machine. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, Okay, and uh, okay, so we are very sad because there are some operations missing, but uh, what can we say, what will come to WebAssembly in the future? So um, there are some of the features uh, which WebAssembly is going to have, and all of those are actually being implemented right now. So um, this is not something we have to expect in the next couple of years, but I guess within the couple of months. So for example, very exciting is threads, I guess, because then we can make our code even faster by parallelizing that. Um, because actually now you are, um, the WebAssembly code runs on the same process as your JavaScript code, so it's executed synchronously. But with threads, you can um, call even multiple WebAssembly functions within, um, within multiple processes and threads, yeah. Um, there's also then um, low-level data operations like Zimd to really do um, for graphical programming, do multiple operations at once. Um, exception handling will be added in garbage collection. And um, I guess a very interesting feature uh, too will be that the ECMAScript modules will be integrated because this will allow us to actually use um, script tags, for example, in our HTML to uh, include WebAssembly, which makes it even easier to use. Um, and also, all the bindings we know from JavaScript will also be integrated into JavaScript. So we have the possibility then um, to use uh, the DOM API and other APIs, CSS, OM, and so on, in our WebAssembly code too. OK, um, so now this is all good and fine. But how do I really create a WASM binary, and how do I use it? So um, instantiating WebAssembly code does look like this. Uh, we have some kind of um, init WebAssembly function. So this is a promise-based, uh, a promise-based interface. Actually, how the WebAssembly code works. I don't know. Uh, does anybody know what async await code means? If you don't, could you please raise your hand? 
Okay, I guess there are some few. Okay, um, so it's special that this function isn't a normal function, but it's an asynchronous function. So every time there's an await keyword there, here the function stops and uh, waits for the operation behind it to be fully executed. So this fetch operation here um, downloads actually the VASM code at the given URL here. And then we have a response object containing the um, WASM code. We create an array buffer of um, the whole code, then it's fully downloaded, also after um, this has been awaited, and these bytes contain the WebAssembly source code. Um, then the next step is we have to manually compile the WebAssembly source code. So um, we tell the machine, okay, please validate our code. This is essential, so every time um, you, you compile the module, the browser first validates that there's no, you did wrong within the stack machine or something like that, and um, that you're not having some kind of, I don't know, try to uh, access memory which you're not allowed to, something like this. And then um, you have a kind of template which you can create an instance of. So and the instance is like, okay, giving life to your module. Um, so in this list, last step here, you um, create a really executable version of your module by binding um, imports to it. So y there, in this object, you can actually just take any value um, from the JavaScript side and uh, bring it to the WebAssembly side by giving numbers. So actually, just numbers are currently supported, right? So uh, integers and floats. And you bind them to the WebAssembly machine. And then this instance can be executed. So, and I have an example. I have a Fibonacci implementation in WebAssembly. I initialize it, have then one instance there. And then you can call one of the exports. Um, all the exports are right what you declare in the WebAssembly file, which you want to be um, accessible from the outside. <coughs> and then um, you can just execute it as a normal function. And in the end, you can just take the example um, as if you have called any other JavaScript function with it. So um, this is quite nice because also if you um, export or if you lock this function out, it's, uh, it will look like um, in your browser like when you um, display any kind of other native function. So, so there's a function Fibonacci uh, and then um, parentheses open and then uh, native code, something like this. Okay, so which languages can we use to create VASM code at this time? So, of course, uh -huh, there was a Go uh, talk, so of course Go is supported. Um, there are also some three other compilers which are quite experimental too, um, which I want to show you. There's Kotlin, for example, and uh, there's also an experimental Swift compiler, which is um, um, not free, unfortunately. And, but there's also something which is quite interesting, and that is assembly script. And assembly script is um, a TypeScript uh, um, oriented programming language, which has the same syntax as TypeScript, but other types. So there you have um, uh, unsigned and signed integer types. You have the float types, which you can use in WebAssembly, but you have the same syntax as uh, in TypeScript. So this is quite easy and intuitive to use if you have uh, worked with JavaScript before and you just want to migrate some parts of your code directly to WebAssembly. On the other side, I want to introduce to you um, four examples with programming languages which have a stable compiler. So there's C and C++, which have um, a native support. Also Rust, and this is where my demonstration is written in, actually. Then there's um, AssemblerJS. Um, maybe some guys of you have heard from it before, or this was actually the way before which you could use to write um, uh, near native code with JavaScript, because um, the mscript compiler, which can generate this assembler.js code, um, uses C input to generate the assembler.js code, and some browsers can interpret this um, assembler.js code as if it would be typed, and so they are faster, and it's nearly the same speed at WebAssembly, but actually WebAssembly is even faster now. So, and um, the last thing is WebAssembly not only offers a binary format which you download to your browser, but there's also a textual representation of it. 
and this textual representation uh, can you also use to debug the code and also to maybe fine-tune some functions or just to um, prototype or just to get started with the language and to experience something. Um, so let's look at some code examples. So uh, here's a C example of how to implement Fibonacci and um, now we take the mscript compiler, which also now has the possibility to output WebAssembly code. This is done by this flag. And then when we um, execute this, we get some kind of um, yeah, uh, helpful JavaScript code actually to get us started where we don't even need this because we can also write the JavaScript uh, for ourselves. So again, we do here a fetch of the WebAssembly file then um, there's a shortcut function which does the comp uh, compilation and instantiation at one time if you don't need to use the, um, module for, um, the module multiple times for multiple instances, for example. Um, and this is also quite nice because, with a hint to my last talk, uh, this is done streaming actually with the Streams API. So uh, the module gets downloaded and while being downloaded, it's actually compiled and instantiated. So it's directly used maybe after the whole WebAssembly code has been downloaded. And actually, um, this is quite fast if you have um, WebAssembly modules, which are very large. So if you imagine you have a large 3D game, and uh, now you can imagine, maybe you have like uh, 50 megabyte of WebAssembly code there, because it's very large, and the user is downloading it. Um, you don't want the user to wait after the download to, having, uh, to have to compile the whole um, game again. So you can do this in parallel while the download um, is running. The browser can already interpret and um, look at the code and even warm up the virtual machine and something like that. Okay, and then we have um, the Fibonacci function here from the C code, just export it and we can call it. Just um, one hint, actually you have to write, I don't know why, um, an underscore for the mscript compiler they added. I'm not quite sure why they do it, but uh, this is just the way uh, it works. Okay. So um, let's take another example from a more modern programming language like Rust. Uh, I like Rust very much for this purpose because uh, you don't have to, um, yeah, have to, um, uh, you don't have to assign your own memory and something like that. Rust comes with those features, and actually, um, Rust developed their own allocator uh, for WebAssembly, which is quite small. So you, um, for those guys um, at the Go talk. Uh, the minimum build size was 2 MB. For us, it's 11 kilobytes. So this is quite small, and you get the whole garbage collection, and uh, not garbage collection, but you get the whole allocator and reference counting features which Rust offers you. So this is uh, an example implementation of Fibonacci. Then you can take the Rust compiler. Rust has their own native um, target for WebAssembly. And after executing, uh, after uh, executing this command, you can simply call the export now without the underscore, actually. So, and this is quite nice, um, because uh, um, Rust is very feature-rich as a language, so you can get easier to learn, or you can get easier to write near native speed code with Rust. And um, for me, well, I come more from a front-end perspective. For me, it wasn't that hard actually learning Rust than uh, learning C or C++. So I guess for some guys of you, if you come also more from a front-end side to WebAssembly, then Rust is maybe the thing for you uh, to go to write something which has uh, more performance in JavaScript and which is able to be compiled to WebAssembly. Just uh, yeah, for uh, the full list, this is how um, AssemblerJS looks like. So you have those fancy or zero statement. This is actually uh, telling the um, the browser that this n here is an integer. So this is a type statement, if you like, if you want to. And so this is the reason why you have to use it at many places because for every result and for every call, you have to tell the browser, okay, this is an integer and please take it for granted, so here's the or zero. And in the end, this is actually the export statement, so we are exporting the Fibonacci function. There's a native um, assembler.js to WebAssembly function included with WebAssembly, which you can then use. And then you have um, a very small, actually, a very small build file because uh, 
as you can imagine, this is not, um, uh, you cannot use garbage collection or anything like this, any features from JavaScript were, which are very fancy. So um, this is this is really uh, on the same level as WebAssembly already. So um, they are, um, they can be called or they can be um, translated from one to one, if you want to, yeah. And the last example, this is the WebAssembly text format. And unfortunately, as um, from a debugger or from a testing perspective, this is the kind of code which we have to deal with um, if we want to debug the WebAssembly which we compiled out of our C, Rust, or anything else. Um, so, and this is kind of, yeah, it looks like, like Scheme or something like this, um, or like Clojure. And uh, you can have some kind of features like, okay, you can give your function a name. So uh, this is written here with the dollar sign. Uh, then you have to declare an export if you want to be able to use the function from the outside. Then there are um, parameters which you declare. So you declare the function signature. And then you can write um, the stack-based machine. Actually, for the WebAssembly text format, you, can, uh, you don't have to use the stack-based um, from uh, formulation, so you don't have to say uh, four, three plus, but you can use um, the folded version. So you can say uh, open parentheses, add four, three, and then close the parentheses. So you don't have to um, always think in stacks, which is quite a natural for us as a human, but it's more natural for us to say, okay, I have the operation, then I have the arguments, and this is how I want to call it. But um, I guess you see it, it's quite complicated because every constant, you have to say it explicitly that there is a constant coming, so it's quite a lot of boilerplate code which you have to write, so please don't write this by hand because it doesn't really make sense. And there are a lot of, um, of nice programming languages coming up. Just um, in the last um, year's next newsletter, for example, there was Vault introduced. I don't know, maybe some guys of you uh, also read the newsletter. And um, Walt is actually a programming language which looks kind of like um, uh, JavaScript, but it uses only the features which are also um, being used or which are also um, included into the WebAssembly text format. And so um, you write uh, smaller code, imperative code, and then it's translated to this um, stack-based format, and then you can work with it um, in, a, in a way so you can uh, manipulate the uh, WebAssembly text format and it's getting recompiled again to the world format. So this is quite nice. Again, there's also a compiler for this, the wet to wasm command. So uh, this is um, how you can use it and how you can maybe debug also some wasm module. Okay, um, for debugging, how does it actually look in your Chrome DevTools if you look at a WebAssembly module? So I hope you guys are shocked because I am, <laughs> because now you see really um, the stack-based machine there. So uh, here you see, okay, this get local zero means I'm accessing actually the zeros parameter, and then um, you have a constant of one, and then comes the uh, less than operator, and this is then bound to an if. So actually what there is the operation if um, the parameter one is smaller than one. So this is quite okay. Uh, if you really want to work with this code, you're really getting mad because you cannot really see um, this out of it, and you cannot even see the, the original um, Rust version out of it or so, because how would you like to debug this code with the stack machine? So this is really an issue of WebAssembly, and you have to deal, or you have to go the way with um, using console log statements in your code, which you can use um, by importing them to WebAssembly with the import object while instantiating, and then you can actually uh, use the console log statement and put values out. So then you can see in the middle, okay, there's some kind of value in between which I want to use, and then uh, you can see, ah, okay, there's a wrong um, result of some kind of function, and okay. So um, there I can go debug the function, try again, and yeah, you have very long uh, feedback loops there, unfortunately. Okay, so um, I also have prepared some demo application, and uh, this is actually the uh, Mandelbrot fractal. 
which I have implemented uh, with JavaScript and with WebAssembly to get the benefit. And uh, the WebAssembly part was actually written with Rust. And uh, my math professor told me, if you show uh, the Mandelbrot fractal, you of course have to show some LaTeX code. So this is actually the definition of the Mandelbrot. I guess we don't have to look at this too long. So let's more look at the code. So um, a nice Rust library. If you, I really would encourage you to, if you want to trust WebAssembly out, try Rust out. Because it's a nice programming language and it's not that hard to um, try it out. And um, there's a nice library for Rust. It's called Wasm-Bindgen. And what it does is actually it polyfills the possibility to use strings and structures and complex objects to be able to transfer them between JavaScript and WebAssembly. And it provides um, the boilerplate code for this, or the glue code on the JavaScript and on the WebAssembly side. Actually, um, the Go compiler from yesterday, it does the same. Um, and so this is quite helpful because now you can write more complex functions. So for example, here um, we have a Rust module. So um, this is not a great use case, of course, but uh, imagine uh, you want to write a greeting function and um, the, Rust, the Rust code uh, knows how to, how to talk to the user, but it doesn't know how to greet. So um, we have a greeting function written in JavaScript here. Um, and then we have uh, the, the WebAssembly code, which then um, does the whole message, which should be uh, put out into the wild. And then in the end, on the JavaScript side, we import this WASM module. So this is the, um, the uh, module which is generated by the WASM Bindgen tool. And then you can call the say hi method here, because this is exported. And then you can read, for example, Marcos. And then in the end, um, you have the whole message and can console lock it um, out. So there you have the possibility, finally, to send strings between your browser and the WebAssembly part. And this is quite nice, because um, now we can write more complex applications. And we can write um, the Mandelbrot fractal, for example. And if you do so, we get a quite nice benchmark. So here. Um, we have, I have measured actually uh, how the two um, implementations perform against each other. And I guess the results are quite nice because so we have um, less latency on, in all browsers. So uh, in, in Firefox and in Safari, the results are really good. I mean, in Safari, it's over 200%. It's quite nice. And um, if you look at the throughput, you even have more um, renderings of your uh, fractal per second. So this is actually the number of fractals uh, which could be rendered per second. And this is actually the uh, duration of one uh, rendering of the fractal on a full HD um, size. So uh, to uh, 100, 920 pixels times uh, yeah, 1,020, I guess. Um, and um, I, I really like those results. And if you would like to um, see the code, um, you can get this uh, on my GitHub profile. And um, it's quite nice, because then you can also see um, that the code difference between the JavaScript and the Rust isn't that large. So if you, if you actually do a diff um, from the Rust and the JavaScript code, so I really implemented them straightforward. They nearly have the same name. And you can really see, OK, um, the difference is very small. And uh, the performance benefit is great. So it does make sense to actually replace single functions um, with, uh, uh, with Rust code and then compile it to WebAssembly. Because it's actually uh, with the Wasm Bungeon tool and um, Building tools like Webpack, it's quite easy to create applications which are then um, uh, which which are built together using WebAssembly, and you as a developer don't have to take care. Okay, um, I have to call the WebAssembly here, or I have to call the um, the JavaScript there. As you have seen in my example here, it doesn't really make a difference if I would call now the greet function from another package or if I would call um, the say hi function from WebAssembly, you as a developer don't really see the difference. OK. Uh, so uh, what should we now do when we have WebAssembly? So uh, we 
at backend, so we do. Uh, this is now the uh, the marketing part. <laughs> Uh, um, so we do um, performance auditing and um, also uh, like to improve the code and make it faster. So it's really tricky to get the last bits of performance out of the code. And um, by looking at new ways, and for example, by using WebAssembly for key functions in your application, which are maybe render blocking or um, which, um, which slow down your web application, and your user um, has to wait long for results, has to wait long for functions, and it's nice if you can replace code. And we would like to help you with that. So uh, feel free to talk to us, um, to talk to me. And uh, also I want to give uh, um, a hint to our other talks. So uh, unfortunately, two talks are over yet, but there's still one to come just um, in the cinema next to us here. Uh, and it's going to be held by Wolle, who is over there. And he's going to speak about um, real-time processing with Dom, Sansa, Spark, and Flink. And we'd really like uh, if you would come there, too. And uh, from my side, uh, thanks for watching. And I'm looking forward to your questions. And yeah, uh, thanks for listening. Other questions? Yes. Two questions. Uh, one is for the Fibonacci function calls, do you always provide the parameter two times, the 21? Uh, actually, oh, okay. The question was I do provide the um, operator for the Fibonacci function uh, two times. Uh, actually, this is an error in my slides, I'm sorry. I had. Um, and I, I used an add implementation first, but I guess it was too trivial. So, and uh, so I, I, I mixed it up, just replacing it everywhere. I'm sorry. The question was um, uh, that Firefox changed the way or uh, added security features. No, when co that okay. Okay. Uh, I took actually the developer nightly edition of Firefox. So I don't know. Maybe it's even after that. I guess. So My question was, uh, how would you access uh, from WebAssembly code a uh, camera device or something that's uh, usually uh, within the navigator and our web APIs? Yeah, okay. Right now, you actually would have to write um, JavaScript glue code for that. So then you can access the, the camera API, then um, get the essential data. Actually, um, in the um, in the example of the fractal, of the fractal um, I can sh actually show this, right? So yeah, so um, if you have this fractal now rendered um, with WebAssembly, you fill a graphical buffer, which is just an array of bytes. And um, in Rust, for example, with the Wasm binding tool, you can pass around byte arrays. So then you can just take the binary data from the camera, pass it to WebAssembly, work with it, and then um, put it out and uh, yeah, show it on the canvas, like in this example with the fractal. OK, thank you. Are there any more questions? Yeah, one there in the back. If there is only the integer in WebAssembly um, uh, and you compile from Go, for example, do you take care to <coughs> like collect all the bool booleans and store it in an integer when compiling or or when translating to WebAssembly, or do I have to? Do some magic myself. So for uh, for Go especially, I don't know it. I'm sorry. So I guess because their compiler is now uh, in an experimental state, so I guess they're not there yet. But I guess they will be there. So because you know they can improve uh, the memory consumption there. But right now, um, most of the WebAssembly usage is 
still in the experimental and in a uh, try to use it, try to test it state. Um, so um, I guess it's not there in any compiler yet. So, if, again, there are no questions. Um, thanks for listening, and uh, please leave a vote for me. It would be very helpful. This was my second Cotox talk, and um, I would really like to hear feedback. And uh, yeah, it would be quite nice.